Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sani, Al Professor Department Chair. So this is going to be a demonstration of the colon. We have removed the small intestine from here. This is a supine cadaver. I'm standing on the right side. Camera person is also on the right side. So before we start the colon itself, there are a few other points which I need to mention to you. Take a look at this peritoneal space where my hand is moving right now. This is called the right paracoli cutter. And similarly, on next to the descending colon, this peritoneal space is called the left paracoli cutter. And both these paracoli cutters, if there's any abnormal fluid collection, the fluid can drain down into the pelvis, which is here. This is the transverse colon. So therefore, the portion of the peritoneal cavity below that is called the infracolic compartment. And we have removed the mesocolon from here. The portion of the peritoneal cavity above that is called the supracolic compartment. The fluid, any abnormal collection from there, supracolic or infracolic or both, can track down the paracolic cutters and they can come into the pelvis. So this is one point which I wanted to let you know. Now let's come to the colon itself. So this is the entire colon that we have excised and we have opened it out. This is the terminal ileum, which we have cut. This is the appendix. This appendix in this particular cadaver, it was touching this muscle here. This is the iliopsoas muscle. And therefore, we already know that in cases of appendicitis, which is the pelvic appendix, it can irritate the iliopsoas muscle and can produce what is known as the hip flexion psoas sign, also called the cope sign. And if we passively extend the right hip, the patient will have pain. That is called the cope's test. So this, this particular cadaver, though he has a normal appendix, it could have been a psoas sign if he had an inflamed appendix. This structure that we see here, where the ileum is opening, this is the cecum. The cecum is a unique part of the large intestine, which is 7.5 centimeters wide and 7.5 centimeters long. So it's got equal length and width. This is the ascending colon. And it, you can see it is attached here by means of a peritoneal fold. This is called the right phrenocolic ligament, which is attached to the hepatic flexure of the colon. This is the transverse colon, which we have separated out. There was a transverse mesocolon here, a double fold of peritoneum, which we have removed. Then we have again another fold, fold of peritoneum, which is attaching this portion of the colon here. This is called the left phrenocolic ligament, which attaches the splenic flexure. And we can see deep down, this structure is the spleen. So therefore, this is the splenic flexure. And this spleen can produce an impression on the splenic flexure that we can see through a colonoscope. Thereafter, this is the descending colon. And then it continues as the sigmoid colon. And we can see it is making a lazy S-shaped curve. That's the reason why this is called the sigmoid colon. And then it continues into the pelvis as the rectum at the level of S2. So this is the full extent of the colon. Now let's come to a few other parts of the colon. Now if you look very carefully, we can see one band of muscle tissue here. We can see only part of it here. This is what is known as tenia coli. What is this tenia coli? Tenia coli are three longitudinal bands of muscle, smooth muscle on the surface of the colon. They are bundled smooth muscle, longitudinal smooth muscle, and they have been given names according to their location in the transverse colon. They have been respectively called tenia mesocolica, tenia libera, and tenia omentalis. So we can see a part of the tenia coli here. To trace the tenia coli further down, we can see this is the tenia coli here. This is the tenia coli. The unique thing about the tenia coli is that all the three bands of tenia coli, they merge at the base of the appendix. So this is a useful landmark that we can use during surgery to trace the base of the appendix during appendicectomy if we have difficulty in locating the appendix. The next structure which I will draw your attention to are these fatty bundles that we see here. These are called appendices epiploicae. There were many appendices epiploicae and we have removed many of them. They are attached to the tenia coli. These are covered by thin layer of visceral peritoneum. Rarely they can undergo torsion and get inflamed and that condition is known as epiploic appendagitis. The next thing which I would like to draw your attention to are these small dilatations of the colon. These are called saculations or hostry. What are these saculations or hostry produced by? These are produced by the slight shortening of the tenia coli, which is a longitudinal smooth muscle. And therefore, it produces these dilatations and constrictions, dilatations and constrictions, which are called hostry. And this same hostry will produce mucosal semilunar folds inside the lumen of the colon. 
So these are three landmarks of the colon that I wanted to bring your attention to. The next thing which I would draw your attention to is the vascular supply. So for that, again, take a look at this arcade of arteries, which I will draw your attention to. We can see one arcade here. And please follow me. We can see that it is going all the way around. It is continuing around. It is going across. It is going across. And then it is continuing to the left side. And it is continuing down. It will continue into the sigmoid also, though we have not dissected out the mesentery of the sigmoid. This is called the marginal artery of Drummond. And from the marginal artery of Drummond, we can see numerous straight blood vessels are going to the colon. Ascending colon, they're going to the transverse colon, they're going to the descending colon. So this marginal artery, how is it formed? It is formed by the branches of the superior mesentric artery for the mid-gut and branches of the inferior mesentric artery for the hindgut. Where exactly is the junction between the mid-gut and the hindgut? This is the transverse colon, as I told you earlier. The junction between the right two-thirds and the left one-third of the transverse colon is the location of the junction between the mid-gut and the hindgut. So the hindgut is supplied by the inferior mesentric artery, which we have not dissected out. It comes out from the abdominal aorta approximately where my finger is located at the level of L3. But we can see the superior mesentric artery, and that we have already removed. This is the superior mesentric artery. And this is the superior mesentric vein. The superior mesentric artery is the artery of the midgut. This arises from the abdominal aorta as an unpaired visceral branch from the level of L1. And we can see it is crossing in front of the third part of the duodenum. This is the third part of the duodenum. And it is giving off numerous branches. These are the jejunal and the ileal branch. But let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the branches to the colon. We can see this branch here. This is the terminal branch of the superior mesentric artery. This is called the iliocolic artery. And this iliocolic artery, it divides into an colic branch or a cecal branch and an ileal branch, which we have cut here because we had removed the small intestine. Then we have the next artery coming from the superior mesentric, that is this one here. This is the right colic artery. Then we have this artery here. This is the middle colic artery. And then we have this artery here. This is the left colic artery, which comes from the inferior mesentric. What do these colic arteries do? Each of these colic arteries, they divide into an ascending branch and a descending branch. And we can see that very clearly here. We can see the right colic is dividing into a descending branch and ascending branch. The middle colic is dividing into a right and a left. This branch is dividing into an upper and a lower. And similarly, this is dividing into a descending and an ascending. All these ascending and descending branches, right and left branches, they all form an endastomatic arcade. And this forms what is known as the marginal artery of Drummond. And from there, the blood vessels go and supply the colon. The venous drainage for the mid-cut is the superior mesentric vein. And this is the superior mesentric vein. The branches, we can see the tributaries. The superior mesentric vein will unite with the splenic vein behind the pancreas and form the portal vein. Again, the inferior mesentric vein is located here where my finger is tracing, but we have not yet dissected out peritoneum. We shall dissect out and then we will be able to see it. There are only two parts of the colon which have got mesentery. The transverse colon, this is called the transverse mesocolon, which we have removed as I said, and the other is the sigmoid colon. It is called a sigmoid mesentery, which is called the mesosigmoid. The mesosigmoid, if you see carefully now, it is inverted V-shaped, the root of the mesosigmoid. This is one limb of the V, this is another limb of the V, and this is the apex of the V. And crossing under the apex of the V will be the left ureter. So therefore, when we are doing any sigmoid surgery, we have to be careful not to injure the left ureter. That brings me to a few other clinical correlations. Cancer of the colon is not very uncommon, especially the descending colon, because the fecal matter is in contact for a longer duration. We can also have sigmoid volvulus. Left side descending colon, we can have sigmoid diverticulosis. So any of these conditions may require excision and anastomosis of the colon. For example, we may require to excise the ascending colon. This is called right hemicolectomy. And then we can anastomose the ileum to the transverse colon that is called iliotransverse anastomosis. We may have to do a subtotal colectomy where we have to remove the two flexures and the transverse colon. And then we can do a colocolic anastomosis. 
we may have to do a left hemicolectomy and we can do like for example in cancer of the sigmoid we may have to do anterior resection and then we can do a colorectal anastomosis or we can bring out the terminal colon as a colostomy so these are some of the surgeries that are commonly performed for the various pathologies that afflict the colon for each of these surgeries we have to be cognizant of these branches and we have to know exactly which branch to ligate so as to remove that segment of the colon so these are some salient points about the surgical aspects of the colon that I want to bring your attention to. That's all for now. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanya signing out. Solomon is the camera person. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day. Please like and subscribe.